our hope now, our peace now, is rooted in the future in Christ and also in eternity past in Christ. And we're hemmed in on every side by Christ and our hope in him. Thanks for listening to If That Makes Sense, the Family Life original podcast about what life is really like as a Christian in your 20s thereabouts. I'm Tim. I'm Mike. I'm Trinity. I'm Mary. Obviously, in a bunch of different ways, it's been a year of struggle is probably the most bland way to put it. And it seems like every podcast we've done in this year has been something about what we've experienced in 2020. So we're just talking in general today about peace. What do you guys personally see as the biggest threat to your peace? What in your experience has had the most power to get at your sense of security? For me, I'd say it's people, those that I can potentially have conflicts with or tension. But I think probably the bigger thing for me will be authority figures, those in power, those in leadership. I often look at leaders and I ask the question, first of all, who's in charge? Are they competent? And if I feel like the answer is no or I can't trust them, That's where it's really easy for me to take my eyes off of Christ and place my trust in people, and then my peace starts to crumble. And I was even thinking, let's say there is a pandemic going on. Well, hypothetically, hypothetically, (laughs) wouldn't, wouldn't a pandemic sort of crush my peace? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized I don't think it's necessarily the pandemic. It's Again, back to the leadership and who's in charge. Are these people in charge coming up with solutions? Are they handling it? Do they have the answers? And if I don't feel like they have the answers, that's when my peace can start to get a little shaky. I mean, I have a lot of things that I feel like threaten my peace. One of them is who I get my news from. Because it's like I don't don't know what sources to trust because you're you're hearing so many different sides of different stories where do i start it's so overwhelming and we are just bombarded constantly with different messages different biases it's so frustrating but also just fear of the future and just not knowing how different my life will look a year from now you know what will my job look like what will my family look like i worry constantly about the safety of my friends and my family, and I get stuck there really easily. I think it's interesting that you bring up the safety of others, because that's something for me that definitely makes me not peaceful. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, My dad, being a state police officer, that's always been something that I've struggled with. Like, is he going to be safe? There's been many times uh, growing up where I'd, I'd watch him leave and then I'd be like, I wonder if I'll see him again. And and that's me being dramatic, but that's something that I've sort of had to deal with. I often worry about the safety of others and I get more nervous when talking about my dad when I know what kind of dangerous situations he's going into. Like just this last year, all of the stuff going on that that scares me. But the funny thing is he goes into dangerous situations every single time he goes on the job. And I don't know about it, (laughs) but I'm only nervous when I know what he's getting into. It has taken me a lot of work to just kind of let go and be like, okay, God has a plan. There's no guarantee that any of us last a day. And so the fact that each day my dad comes home from work, that's a blessing. The future and the trustworthiness of our information or our authority figures, all those things have to do with unknowns. And for me, I answered my own question as my own lack of peace, I think, comes most often from just not knowing, not knowing what to do in a given situation or not knowing what could happen. And as I was thinking about this, I was like, yeah, that's pretty understandable, right? To have a lack of peace when you don't know, when you don't know the future, when you don't know what to do. And then I thought about it, oh, wait, it's a universal human condition to not know the future, and to not know the perfect thing to do in every circumstance. 
So pretty much I diagnosed myself that I have a lack of peace whenever I'm not God. <laughs> and that means I'm putting my peace in the wrong place. If I'm like, well, really, if I were just, I don't know, God, this would be a lot better. Ask Adam how well that worked out when he tried to be like God or Satan when he tried to be like God. That was really eye-opening for me to realize, wow, the thing I'm trying to grasp at that I think I'll have peace if I just have this is the same apple that was held out to Adam. Okay, fruit for folks who get persnickety about what (laughs) fruit it might have been. Depending on your Bible (laughs) translation. Yeah, and an apple in most of the pictures, folks. I've been to the Creation Museum. I don't remember what it was there, but it was probably an apple. Oh, the animal. flannel graphs as kids, it was definitely oh, an definitely. apple. Yeah. Biblically, what is peace, biblically speaking? So there's this verse that's really special to me because my mother has prayed it over me, I think, my whole life. And I only found out recently that it's what she'd been praying for me since I was little. And it's uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hearing that from my mom, that's what she has prayed for me when I struggle so much with fear, I think more than most people realize, means a lot to me. But I think what that verse is saying is the Holy Spirit empowers us to face the things in life, the trials we can rest in the fact that we have the Holy Spirit. We can face these things, and it's it's not going to be easy, but we can take these things that we are afraid of, and we can offer it back to God and be like, God, I'm afraid. I'm so afraid, but I trust you. This year, especially that verse has probably become one of my favorites. I guess also peace is just holding on to the hope that we have as Christians because we know that this isn't our home. This is just one part of the journey. And we have so much to look forward to as Christians because we know that someday we are going to be united with Christ and we get to experience eternity with him, which is just amazing. And I I don't stop to think about it enough. To that end, specifically, I was was thinking about that, that what our hope is as Christians is what we have in Christ. And Romans 8 seemed like a good place to go for, okay, but how do we ground this in Scripture? Romans 8, uh, 26 through 30. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know. That's where all my insecurities come from. But he's saying it's okay. It's okay that we don't know. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So we don't know what to pray for in individual circumstances, but we do know the end, that everything is going to work together for us, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. When we're glorified, it's when we're with Christ in heaven in eternity. It hasn't happened to us yet, but it's so sure in our calling in Christ that from God's perspective, it's as if it's already happened. So our peace in what we do not know, and so therefore we're praying and the Spirit is helping us out, is to the end of what we do know, which is that God's going to work all things together for our good because we're his children, even the things that are not good in the moment. Because what he's always known is true, and that's that we're secure, we're held in him. Our hope now, our peace now, is rooted in the future in Christ and also in eternity past in Christ. And we're hemmed in on every side by Christ and our hope in him. And that sounds really great and all, and that's a biblical definition of it, but holding on to it and feeling it is entirely another thing that I fail at literally every day. As in like Miriam Webster, literally, where it means <laughs> literally. I fail at that every day. And I think that's so helpful because I think we always just throw around the sentence, you don't need peace with your circumstances or peace doesn't come from your circumstances. It comes from God. So we all know that. But what does that actually mean? I guess part of it maybe goes back to something that we talked about in our episode on politics, interestingly enough. Thankfulness dissolves, in that episode we were talking about anger that often accompanies the political sphere. Thankfulness can dissolve that. 
I've been thinking a lot lately too about the role thankfulness can play in worries and in holding on to peace. The other verse I have written down is one I've been reminded of by people lately. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, these verses, Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I'm too anxious to practice it, but I'm pretty sure if while I'm nervous and anxious about things, if I stopped myself to think about what I'm thankful for, It'd probably be really helpful. It kind of goes back to, we keep referencing past episodes, but it kind of goes back to when we were talking about loneliness and we kind of, in a weird sort of way, like it. Right. I don't know why. I don't understand it. I don't think I want to like to be anxious. Maybe it's because we feel more in control. Hmm. Because I feel like if you're putting those anxious thoughts aside and you're not you're choosing not to think on them you're choosing not to dwell on them I think maybe we have this weird sixth sense of well I'm controlling it I feel more aware and I feel like I can do stuff about it and I can pull all these things in to fix it to take it away yeah I was gonna say well you're married to me Trinity so you probably know that it looks a lot of times like I like worrying because I choose to do it so often but I think that's why I often come back to it as a bad habit Mm. because it's like at least I'm trying to do something about it. I'm trying to think of a solution. But is that actually what you're doing at this point? As I was doing some research, I was thinking, okay, so what are some other words for peace? So there's like namaste and things like that. And there's shalom, which is the Jewish word for peace, which I hate to say because it's so much more than that. Shalom means so much more than peace. I decided to pull a mic and um, Mm -mm. have a quote. I know. Sorry, Mike. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I didn't search for this quote very hard. It was on Wikipedia. But it was Wikipedia quoting a book. So it's not the same thing. Okay, so this quote is from a book called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be by Cornelius Plantigna or something like that. So this is what he says about Shalom. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Hebrew prophets call Shalom. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire of, of enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which the natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed, a state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. That's kind of mind-blowing. Like Another way to think of it is like someone built this wall, it got pieces broken out of it, and they put it back together the way it's supposed to be. Hmm. Shalom. Things in their rightful relationship to God, Mm -hmm. that means peace on a much deeper level. Yeah. I have this theory that peace in some regards is kind of like love. And the first way they're similar is the classic, I love my dog, I love pizza, I love my wife. It's the same word, but it means three different things. They're related, but they're not the same. Hmm. So I was looking through different like biblical meanings of peace. It seemed to be kind of the same thing. And I think even just as we were all sharing, we were all talking about peace and all talking about similar things, but it wasn't that we were repeating the same thing each person said. So I think peace is like that and that it means slightly different things in different ways. I sort of boiled it down into two groupings. From what I could find about biblical peace, the first grouping I had was peace as an intentional decision. A definition I found that I liked a lot was peace is the realm where chaos is not allowed to enter. The realm where chaos is not allowed to enter. Hmm. And at first, I was thinking this isn't an important definition because it doesn't stand true today. There's pandemics, there's this, there's sickness, there's strife, there's all these things. How can it say that peace only happens when there's no chaos? And then I read it again. It doesn't say the realm where where there is no chaos. It says the realm where chaos is not allowed to enter. 
implying that chaos will be there and its absence is not a requirement for peace. And I think there comes the next similarity between love. Love isn't just a feeling. Perhaps it's not even primarily a feeling. Sometimes we just choose to love the people who we can't stand. And, and peace also, I would say, is probably not primarily a feeling. At least we don't just stumble into peace. I think it has to be an intentional decision to say, look at all this stuff that's going on right now, but I'm choosing peace because peace is the realm where chaos is not allowed to enter. I like that I'm writing that down. I like that so much, Mike. <laughs> oh, good. I was just going to say, where's that from again? It's a book called War and Peace in the Bible or something like that by a guy named Hanson. Okay. So the second of the two groups that I devised, I called a contractual agreement. The definition I found was right relationship or harmony between two parties or people often established by a covenant. And I immediately thought of God and me, the covenant that happens the moment that I ask Christ to come into my life, the moment of salvation, there's this peace that happens. And it has nothing to do with me or how I behave or feelings. It's peace between God and I, because up until that point, we were at war, right? Because I'm a sinner and God's perfect. We go back to what Tim was talking about with Romans, and that's how peace can happen despite our circumstances. It's because that peace has nothing to do with the things around us. It has to do only with God and me. And God never changes, so it's sealed. And then just combining those two things, the intentional decision side of peace with the agreement side of peace, I found this third definition, peace of God is the harmony and calmness of the body, mind, and spirit, trusting in the power and grace of God. Yeah, calmness implies that it does have a feeling aspect, but you're absolutely right that for there to be a zone that chaos can't enter, it's a decision too. Yeah. And I I don't ever want to come across as sounding like love doesn't involve feelings or peace doesn't involve feelings because it absolutely does. It does have to do with feelings. I think maybe the tendency is for us mere humans to put too much emphasis on the feelings. And if I don't feel peace, then it must not be there. Yeah. So we've kind of already been here a little bit in what we've been talking about in what the Bible says about our peace. But specifically for you, what can or should biblical peace mean for your life? Or another way of putting it, how would your life look different right now if you were living with the peace that you think you should have as a Christian? I feel like we sort of talked about it in the last question when we were talking about how it's almost like we want to keep those insecure and fearful feelings and not let go of them and let go and let God. But I think that's just one of the steps you have to take when you're trying to be peaceful, trusting God. A practical way to do that would be to say, so, hey, God, I'm feeling anxious right now, and this is why, and I thank you that you're in control, bringing in the Thanksgiving, and that's why the Bible says to pray without ceasing, because it's so easy to become afraid, nervous, and questioning the future and everything, but if we're talking to the, the only one who actually knows the future... It's the only way to have peace, Hmm. at least real peace. Hmm. I have three bullet points. This is great. This is great. Mike, are you planning to be a pastor? Are you planning to become a pastor? Because these three points, are they alliterated? I just want to know if they're alliterated. I I thought the first two are. There's a way. Actually, they are. I just found a way. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Pastor Mike's going to bring it. So, (laughs) So the question How would my life look different right now if I were living with the peace I think I should have as a Christian? Three bullet points. First, I would be seeking truth. So seek truth. Seek is the word we're going with here. Okay. okay. Um, Seeking truth. So I don't think that we should necessarily just walk away from all the things that are happening or not know what's going on or anything like that. 
but it's so important to seek truth. And Trinity, what you were talking about, where your new sources come from, just know what's true, know the facts, don't get carried away with your emotions, like, oh, I read this post on Facebook. Can you believe this person acted like this? Now I'm going to do this thing instead. But if I'm seeking truth, I think that's a good starting point. Then the second one, I said, seek to understand rather than be understood. As you can even see right now, I love everybody to hear all of my ideas that I have. And that's why I have all of my notes here and I wanted to make sure you all heard everything. But if I'm seeking to understand rather than be understood, I can start to see that the people who don't think like I do aren't necessarily evil people. They're people with different perspectives. And likely there's some truth in where they're coming from. Just as likely with me, I don't have all the truth and all the facts. And we can meet somewhere in the middle and there's a gajillion and five different opinions out there my opinion doesn't necessarily need to be hung out for everybody to see. I think it's more important that I start understanding other people more than me forcing them to understand me. And then the first thing, I did say trust God, but I think I'm going to change it to seek God. Better, definitely, for S Pastor Mike's seek purposes. Seek God and affirm the full power and scope of the peace he promises not like this little boxed up version of peace where it only means a feeling and I pray, God, help me feel peace in this stinky situation. But understanding the full scope of the peace that has to do with the relationship between me and God that happened the moment I was saved that never changes and never wavers. The idea that God offers peace despite all the things going on and then just living in that place and affirming that reality that it's not this little boxed version of peace that can only be so big because it only has to do with my feelings, but the fullness of that. So there you have it, folks. Seek truth, seek to understand, seek God. Does anybody else feel like Mike's points are always super practical? Yeah, mm -hmm. I feel like you should write a book, Mike. No. I, I would read I, it. I would too, yeah. I think if I was actually doing this, okay, what would my life look like? I think... I would just be happier. Now that sounds really trite and simple, right? I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but I frequently feel an impulse of something, oh, that I'm excited for. Something I feel like I could just be happy about. I feel like I have to pull back and not let myself just be thankful for that thing. Just be simply content in a situation because, oh no, I probably have something I should be worrying about. There's probably something serious going on There's right now. Something could go wrong. Yeah, this. you're right. You're right. <laughs> something could go wrong. Better be on my guard because there's more important things. And I probably have something I should be being responsible and thinking about. It's pretty simple to just say, oh, I think if I just let that over to God more, I'd probably just be happier. I'm trying to control this situation, so I'm going to be wise and think about it and not be too trusting. Okay, that's just a fancy way of saying I'm going to let myself be anxious. Ironically, also, I think another result of having true peace in my life would be I would be more effective at solving problems. I think I'd be more effective and helpful for myself and others and just better at getting things done. Ironically, when we stop and worry about how to do everything and how to help all of our family and how we can best help ourselves, we do a much worse job at each of those things. That's going to happen when my peace is rooted in my past, present, and future in Christ. Sometimes we come back to these cliches because they're classic for a reason, a lot of these. It's not about uh, knowing the future. It's about knowing the one who holds the future. There are many variations of that that exist in Christendom. And it's because it's a pretty good thought. Easy to say on a podcast and hard to do in a real Christian life. <laughs> I was, I was sitting over here laughing to myself when you were talking about the an enjoyable moment in your life and you think, I shouldn't enjoy this because there should be something that I'm worrying about. I'm like, I do that same thing. And then here's the next stupid thing I do. If I can't think right off the top of my head what that thing is I should be worrying about, I stop what I'm doing and then I try and figure out <laughs> what I should be worrying about. And then, and only then, if I truly can't think of anything that I should be worrying about, the sense of peace, and it, it goes to Mary's definition of shalom, where she was talking about fullness and the way things should be. And like, you can just fully enjoy the moment where you're at, 
because you're not thinking about the future and that thing to worry about. For me, it's because I can't think of anything to worry about, which doesn't often happen. But in the few precious moments that it does happen, it it is like this thing where you sort of feel, oh, I think this is what fullness feels like, where you're just present in the moment and there's peace with you and God, your creator, no matter what the circumstances are, everything's going to end okay. And I bet that thing I feel at the end is peace. I bet that's <laughs> what peace actually feels like. And, and I shouldn't feel like I can only have it once I've eliminated all the options I know to worry about. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> odds are you're just forgetting something. Of course there's something course. to worry about. Of course <laughs> there you. is. Yeah. We're very I would, creative I wish I would have thought of that thing that I could have been worrying about it instead of having peace. Who says that? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Said no one ever. This is probably my favorite podcast episode because I feel like it's been the most helpful for me. I guess I'll just say I'm really struggling right now and I'm really afraid. So hearing all of your thoughts is really helpful for me. So fear is super real for me and I'm struggling. You know, everyday tasks can be really hard for me when I just feel like bombarded by all this stuff and I don't always know how to handle it and I kind of shut down and I feel like this year God has so kindly spoken to me and I don't I don't say that very often (laughs) but he's just reminded me so much this year that this world isn't my home my story doesn't end here he's kind of given me these glimpses of heaven this year that I haven't really recognized in the past And it reminds me of the hope that I have. And some of those things are looking at the stars at night on my porch or when I come home. It's embracing my husband and my dog after a long, hard day. It's the seasons changing and getting to witness the beauty of all of that. These small things are just little gifts from the Lord that remind me just to hold on to the hope that remind me of the goodness and the joy that is ours. Again, it doesn't even end there. It's just a glimpse because how much more will heaven be? I love this quote from Lord of the Rings. I always say, this is my favorite Lord of the Rings quote. This is my favorite Lord of the Rings quote. But I really think this one is my favorite Lord of the Rings quote. (laughs) And it's in Return of the King, and this one is from the film. Pippin and Gandalf, are. it's at Battle for Gondor, and hope is lost. And Pippin and Gandalf just share this really beautiful, quiet moment. And Pippin, um, he's just filled with despair and hopelessness. And he just says, I didn't think it would end this way. Gandalf says, end? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all must take. The gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass. And then you see it. Gandalf, see what? White shores and beyond, a far green country under a swift sunrise. Well, that isn't so bad. And Gandalf says, no, no, it isn't. And I just love how it so beautifully illustrates what we as Christians will someday experience. And right now, despite the fear that I'm wrestling with on a, an hourly basis, really, is I'm holding on to the hope that is mine in Christ, and that is Christ is waiting with open arms at the far green countryside under a swift sunrise to welcome me home and into eternity, and that hope is what I cling to and gives me the peace that people so desperately search for. I'm crying over here. You can't see I, it because I, I don't cry. I'm never literally, literally crying. <laughs> Unlike Mike over here, he says he's uh, crying. I just love <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go watch Extended edition Lord of the Rings tonight. All of them. Hope you have nine hours. I might not see you guys tomorrow. We're so glad you joined us for another episode of If That Makes Sense, the Family Life original podcast where we talk about what life is really like as a Christian in your 20s. If you enjoyed what you heard, we would be so grateful if you'd subscribe or share this podcast where you share things you care about with the people you care about. And also feel free to check out the other Family Life podcasts we've got at fln.org slash podcast, like Therese Talk with Family Life Morning's own Therese Main. You can find those and more on your favorite podcast app or at fln.org slash podcast. Thanks so much for joining us, and we're looking forward to talking with you in the next one.